Hello. Hi. The first question I would like to ask, are people born homosexual or is it a choice? And how is that revelation interpreted throughout the Bible? And how does the Catholic view, what is the Catholic view, I guess? So Boy, we're out of time. <laughs> <laughs> So, so there's, I mean, several parts there. Do you want to, you want to start, Rana? The Bible does not tell us whether homosexuality is um, something you're born with or whether you make that choice. Second thing I would say about the Bible is um, it's important to ask questions of the text that the original readers or the original authors would have asked, right? Not necessarily, that's, and it's a good question, yeah. not necessarily one they would have asked. Um, the other question, or what I would respond to it is, I, regardless of whether you're born that way or whether you choose to it, the gospel of Christ is the same, and how we should treat each other is the same. Um, being made in the image and likeness of God is the same. So I think while in a lot of political discourse that question becomes very important, whether you're born that way or whether it's a choice, I don't think it matters to God. Mm -hmm. Yeah. The only thing I would ask, going back also to, to, to science, is that that's more a scientific question that from the theological perspective we might still not have defined. And so we might still need more both uh, more scientific understanding and more theological understanding on it. <clears throat> Is homosexuality anti-biblical? I think it's worth defining some terms. Um, what do we mean by homosexuality? Do we mean attraction? Uh, do we mean love? Do we mean acts of sexual violence? Uh, I think the Bible is very clear that, that rape is not okay. Uh, I think the Bible is very clear that when human beings try to rape angels in Genesis 18, that that's not okay. Uh, I think the Bible is pretty clear uh, that uh, using economics to coerce men into male prostitution is not okay. Um, I could go on. Uh, I think when we read the Bible, we need you know, to think um, about our categories and biblical categories and not assume that they're the same. Uh, I, and I think we need to um, use the Bible as a mirror to hold up to ourselves. Um, when I hold the, the, the mirror, uh, the Bible up as a mirror, uh, I don't see judgment on people who, who love each other and want to uh, have the same benefits of visitation in the hospitals. Uh, as their heterosexual counterparts, or the same inheritance rights as their heterosexual counterparts, uh, I see a critique of the criminal justice system. Uh, when I was a student, um, uh, the university police department uh, somehow thought I did something. I knew I didn't do it. I was certain I didn't do it. I was certain there couldn't be any legitimate evidence that I had done it. Uh, but they believed otherwise. And they said, well, if you confess, we'll say you were cooperative and uh, we'll go up in the stand and we'll say how sorry you were and you'll just get probation. But if you don't, we won't say, speak up for you and you'll go to prison and a pretty young thing like you will be raped every single day. I knew I didn't commit the crime, but ever since then, I don't see any confession as, as um, reliable. So I think if we're going to talk about what the Bible would say about our society with respect to homosexuality, we need to look at rape. Rape is what the Bible is clear and consistent in condemning, whether it's against men or against women. We cannot tolerate a criminal justice system that uses rape as a not just a punishment, but, but a tool against the innocent. That is, is what I think uh, the Bible is clear on. Not to counter um, Dr. Hanneken, 
But to acknowledge what sometimes people may want to use to say that the Bible does condemn homosexuality uh, or it, that homosexuality is against the Bible is that passage by uh, St. Paul where he names, says, he lists several things. And therefore people think uh, that it is the same kind of act that he is condemning as we have it today. And that's not uh, the context. So during the entire afternoon we have been here, we have been talking about how to read the Bible also in the context in which it was directed. And he was referring more really to uh, what we now would call in many ways as well, not only that, but also uh, minor sexual abuse. And that of course is also against God's, uh, God's uh, will. I think we always have to see uh, th those sexual relationships uh, in the context of love instead of just the context of the sexuality aspect. I, I would also, um, to add on, uh, very well said, I would say, um, there were three dimensions or three worlds to the text that I mentioned uh, in my own talk, right? The, the world behind the text, that's the historical context in which it emerged, the world of the text, what it literally says, uh, and then, not literally, but exactly says, uh, and then the world of the reader, right? The world of the reader. And too often we forget about the world of the reader. I mentioned we're reading texts as Roman Catholics, so our own tradition is important. And I don't identify as LGBTQ or queer, but if I were to be that and read the Bible, then LGBTQ-ness and queerness would be biblical. Because in that respect, that's what I am bringing to the text and to my interpretation of it. Um, and what I bring to the text is as important to what God is telling me through it as what is in the text itself and the historical context behind it. So I would say in some respects, and in that respect, uh, you can say yes, that it is. Question from Zoom have a, We have a question from Zoom, and I would love to uh, have you offer that to us. Let me see if, if you unmute, we should be able to hear you. you might. So I think it was um, Scott who has this question. I think you need to okay. turn the sound on on the other keyboard. Sorry, Scott, we can't hear you. Ah, so, uh, well, they do that. One thing I can say about biblical interpretation I I that I learned over the years, yeah. also as a preacher, yeah. uh, as a priest, is that the Bible, reading the Bible should be liberating. It should not be enslaving. And it should be opening our minds to God, <clears throat> not closing our hearts to people. I think when you do that, you can find in the texts, even the worst of the texts in the Bible, the ones about violence and people killing and all of that, you can find in the whole story, especially the long-term story, God's love for people and for creation. All right, I think we're set. Thank you, Dr. Hannigan. So, uh, Scott, if you will go oh, ahead. Oh, sure, okay. Thank you for fixing the problem. You, you can hear me now, right? Mm -hmm. Yes. Okay. All right, my question is that I work in, in the queer community in San Francisco. Uh, many of the LGP, LGBTQ and A and I people have been profoundly traumatized by Christians accusing the queer community of being an abomination. Uh, <clears throat> I have often heard that you. Uh, I've read John Boswell's works I guess that I would like some of your insights from his writings, but also uh, I find that many in the queer community reject outright Christianity, that either the Christians or, or scripture has anything to say of value to the uh, queer community. Uh, they've been so traumatized and hurt by it. And, and recently uh, many bishops are firing uh, Many U.S. bishops are firing employees who are queer identified or in queer queer relationships, and new and some bishops are even putting in school high school documentation uh, that a, a transgender 
person has to be identified has has to be recognized on their as their gender identity at birth and yet so can you talk to any of that and do you have any any suggestions of how scripture can speak new a new and life-giving language to this community if i can answer first and i'm sure that uh, the biblical uh, scholars will say more specifically about that I will make the, the issue larger in the sense of not apologizing for the church, but certainly saying that many groups across history may have felt like that. And the point that, 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 that I like to make uh, with every group would be don't give up because giving up on the church may also mean giving up on God. And we, we should never really be giving up on God, right? So while the church is the means, it is not the end. And therefore, uh, some people may give up on that, that is out of trauma uh, or, or other reasons, but don't give up on God. And eventually, you might want to come back to what we would call the family or that, that, that media that allowed you to have a deeper relationship with God. Yeah, and I would add, don't just give up on God, but don't give up on the Bible. Um, the Bible has been used by a lot of people to do very uh, hurt, hurtful things. Uh, I, don't, I don't think Jesus went around you know, calling people abominations. Um, at least I didn't read that passage. Um, but I think people that, um, you know, that, are, that are struggling um, it can find a lot in the Bible, not necessarily because they're going to, you know, do a search for, uh, you know, Bible uh, LGBTQ and, and get helpful answers. Uh, but but if, we, if we encounter the narratives, uh, we, we find, uh, we have to open our categories, our minds a little bit, um, you know, but I think of, of Jacob, who is nothing to do with, you know, gender identity per se, but it has to do with um, the way we're perceived as a result of our birth. When we're, we're born a certain way, uh, we don't live up to our parents' expectations necessarily, like Jacob. Uh, the roles assigned to us at birth are not right. And Jacob had to fight against that. Jacob struggled with that. Jacob struggled to, uh, to, to, to be who he was uh, as the inheritor of God's blessing, despite his birth and despite his father's disapproval. Um, Again, you know, you have to look a little bit outside the, the, the box a little bit. Uh, but Job, Job is someone whose entire society was convinced that a certain thing had to be true, and it wasn't true. His experience was contrary to what his society expected to be true. Because the society expected if someone is suffering, it's because they sinned. He knew that was not true. Society was wrong. I mean, the readers of the book of Job know from page one that society is wrong, and there is, in fact, something else going on here that's not what society expects. So I think the, the message, the, the Bible has a lot of messages for people that are, uh, you know, that are struggling against, against oppression, against uh, society that doesn't understand them, uh, social expectations based on, on birth and so forth, uh, and, and ultimately the hope of, of, of liberation, that, that all of these dumb things that humans do are not the end of the story. The end of the story is not humans being dumb. The end of the story is God making it right somehow. And that's the hope that I think the Bible still has to offer, even, even the people who, who suffer, especially the people who suffer. We look at one aspect of sin, let's say, um, or we, you know, call it homosexuality as sin or bad or whatever. But let's look more on a wider aspect of what Jesus does. When Jesus meets someone who is a sinner, what does Jesus do? He does not condemn, he does not reject. He forgives. He says, go, just don't do it again. Mm. That's all. And he does not 
condemn or judge or anything. He's just saying, working with human nature, do your best. The other thing is, as was brought up a little while ago, our God is a God who frees and liberates, beginning with the people in Egypt, how God chooses them and frees them, and afterwards is always setting his people free. And that means everyone to be set free from whatever. And this is, I think, where we have to look at the scriptures, not so much as one aspect and say this covers everything, but rather look at what God the, does in these scriptures, in the Tanakh and the Old Testament, uh, liberates freedom, sets you free. And this is all that Jesus then continues to do in his time, in his ministry on earth, to set people free. And if we are really the disciples and followers of the Lord, this is exactly what we have to do ourselves, set other peoples free. Hmm. Did you understand? So I don't know if this is, it's something, this is something that's been on my mind. And since you all brought up the topic, <laughs> um, I just want to, um, so, so Father, this is directed to you, <laughs> to all fathers, to all priests, okay? So, but you're up there, so maybe you can help me out. Sure. Um, so years ago, in the 90s, um, the church priests, in my opinion, were so cruel to people that were Catholics and not designated as LGBT, they were just people that liked the same sex. It wasn't classified as that back then. Um, and they went to the, they were true Catholics, like devotional, devotional Catholic individuals. And the church, in my opinion, and the way I believe, is the safest place. And so they went there with open arms and open heart because of what they were going through. And that so many of these individuals have left the Catholic faith and the Catholic Church. They've gone to other churches, non-denominational, whatever, to, experience, to find a place, right? This love, that this word has been mentioned, love, many times in the last 10 minutes. And, um, and then the church wonders, like, well, why have we lost our, why have we lost the people of our, the Catholic Church. Why have we lost our communion? Why have we lost our community, our membership, or whatever you want to call it? Um, and they want so badly to come back, or they, or they come hiddenly, or something, and to the church. And so, I don't even know. I, I, my my last words were like, "What is happening?" Or like, "How do you explain this to me?" Please. I would find a safe a safe church to go to because the church being all of us human beings you will find excellent people and you will find the worst sinners and sometimes as you go out you've gone out because there, you found the worst sinner but as you try to come in to come back in a sense it's like a, a, in your own family you try to come in where you feel safer coming in so not every church, that's why nowadays, even though we still have jurisdictional parishes, right? People nowadays go to the parish that they like, even if they have to drive 30 minutes to get there. So find, find a community that welcomes you. That's what I would say to anybody who's trying to come back or wants to find some affirmation in, in the Catholic community. While, while it would be nice if you go to the parish that, that where you belong <laughs> by, by geographical location only, if you have to drive 30 minutes because that, 
That's where you, you'll find God, your heart, and eventually come back to where you might need to be. Do what, do what feels safest at this time. Do what feels most affirming at this time for you. Because that's what the church is. At the end of the day, the church is the community of faith that wants to affirm humanity. Just like Pope Francis says, and I believe it or not, I try not to use Pope Francis <laughs> so much, precisely because there are some people who mm. generally are talking so badly about him. But, and I know him personally, by the way. But uh, he always says that ch we need to see the church as the field hospital. So if we are, especially the priests, are, 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 are the ones in the hospital and are going to be treating people, we need to be good nurses. But not everybody learns to be a good nurse. That's all. So, I be any, in, in fact, when I hear confessions, and this is the, my last point, when I hear confessions, I sometimes say, there was only one confession that was worthwhile being there for an hour and a half. Because that's the only confession that I really consider a coming back home to Jesus for that person. Uh, when they are finally coming to terms with their own sense of who they are and the sin, whatever sin they have committed. The other ones, they're just novellas. <laughs> telling me a story, telling me a simple sin, things like that. But when I hear somebody say, it was 15 years ago that I, that I did my last confession, usually I ask them, why did you come back? Why do you want to be reconciled to God in this way? Precisely because of what you're talking about. So I need to be paying more attention to those people that need to come in and be affirmed and be welcomed like the prodigal son or daughter and not be with the, the stick telling them, you sinner, you came back. <coughs> Hope that so helps. So that message goes across to all priests, yes? That's the hope. I try to be as pastoral as I can. <clears throat> okay, so I'm, I may ramble a little. <laughs> also, I'm a little passionate about the subject because I am gay. And I'm actually currently in a relationship with a wonderful woman. And I want to ask her to marry me. And I also believe in the Catholic faith. I believe in Jesus Christ as my Lord and Savior. I believe he died for me. I believe he loves me. I believe God loves me. I believe God, Jesus, and the Holy Spirit are a trinity. I believe in the Holy Virgin Mary. I don't not believe in all those things. Yet, your answer, as great as, as, great as it was, is not fulfilling for me. In the sense that I can't feel like I can say that I belong to a church that calls me an inherent sin. His question about is homosexuality a sin? I think we need to it's time that we re revolutionize the church. And it's time that we finally dig deeper. There's, I think, less than 10 Bible verses that speak about homosexuality. The word itself wasn't even added till very recently, right? And when was it? Can you tell me that? 1946, the word homosexuality was added in the John Wy Wyckoff. Wy am I talking correctly? I don't know the details, but it was added then. Previous to that, I feel like in the Old Testament, which he was trying to say Le Leviticus or um, abominations or Saddam and Gomorrah, all these different examples, they use um, different translations and words, right? So I, I know there's a word called arsenicatoi, that translates to uh, a little, I guess, a male slave, sex slave, right? A little male prostitute, mm -hmm. a young one, right? And then we've translated that word and also sodomite and turned it into homosexuality and a lot of the things that you said were saying like rape is condemned and uh you know angel all these different like sinful like clearly sinful things have been condemned but i don't think that the love that i feel for a woman should be is, is not the same as like those sinful things so i, I don't think that homosexuality itself it's been condemned as a sin, and if it has, I think that we need to really reevaluate re the writing because I don't think that just he us here sitting in the audience who have no education of who the ancient Israelites were and what was going on in, for example, Rome when Paul was talking about homosexuality, who, 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 who was he really talking to? 
Was he talking to an audience, you know, doing different things? And I feel like we have come to a place with not just Catholicism, but Christianity, Mormonism, even in Islam, where we're anti-homosexuality. Um, anti like, it's whether we're accepting them. They're a them. They're not a part of humanity. I'm not a part of humanity. So I'm, I'm not the same as you guys, because I'm somehow different because I, of who I love. And it's not necessarily about sexuality, even though I'm not saying that that's not important, but it's not. It's about who, an expression of love. And I think that it is time that we reevaluate it and talk about it in the deep issues and really go through, because we've been wrong before. Clearly, in Christian America, I'm just talking about racism, we were wrong, right? We were using the Bible verses, twisting them so that we can put it and say that slavery was okay. Also, as women, think about it. Like, women have been oppressed for such a long time in the Bible. We take lots of Bible verses, like, for example, what was happening with Abraham, Sarah, and Hagar situations and other different times where, like, you know, uh, it was justified for the woman to be a sub, a, uh, or underneath a man. When we've now really been taking those verses into context and realizing that they're not talking about a man being superior to a woman, you know, we're equals. And so there's, I feel like, could it be that it, we're wrong about homosexuality the way we've been looking at it? Because I, I don't remember one in the last panel, someone said that we can judge something by its fruits. And I think the fruits right now, as of the 20th or 21st century, we are leave, having more and more people live, leave religion by the thousand tolls. It's down percentage-wise. I think by like, I don't remember the last time I Googled it, but it was like over 60%, like half of people are leaving religion. Most of the, sorry, wrap it up. I guess, I guess my question is, can, like, is homosexuality a sin? Is there something that we can do to change that? And uh, how can we spread love to the, the LGBT community with, uh, some, without saying, well, you guys are a sin, but all sins are sins, you know? We're still gonna love you, like the blanket kind of answer that you give, like, I guess. Good, here, sorry. I'd like to respond, if you don't mind. Yeah. Um, I'd like to take one piece of what you said and respond to that, and maybe others can respond too. Uh, one of the questions that came to us was, how did the meaning of Sodom or sodomy change to mean homosexuality? And I'm going to answer through the words of someone who, um, who has dealt with that better than I could ever do, and his name is Nick Geyer. I believe he's part of the LGBTQ community. So he says, interestingly enough, Jesus did not interpret the sin of Sodom as sexual. Okay, this is the Sodom and Gomorrah happening in Genesis. First, Jesus says nothing specific about the sin of homosexuality anywhere in the Gospels. He does, of course, speak of sexual sins, but all of us, regardless of our orientation, commit a few of those. Second, when Jesus instructs his disciples to preach in the towns of Israel, he warns that those who do not receive them peacefully will be judged more harshly than the people of Sodom and Gomorrah. So Jesus joins other ancient authorities in viewing the sins of the Sodomites as the abuse of strangers, neglecting the poor and needy, and the stigmatizing of outsiders. So for example, Ezekiel says that the people of Sodom and Gomorrah had pride, surfeit to food, prosperous ease, but did not aid the poor and the needy. And the wisdom of Solomon says, they refused to receive strangers when they came to them. On the other hand, an early Christian book in First Clement states that lots Lot was saved because of his hospitality and piety. So it is significant that Jesus does not um, specifically say that there is sin in homosexuality in any of the Gospels. Um, so if you'd like to read the rest of this, it's called The Real Meaning of Sodomy, and it's by Nick Geyer, and you just have to Google it. He's a professor at the University of Idaho. Um, so that's in response to one little bit of what you said. So maybe our other panelists can take it from there. 
Thank you, I appreciate that, because that's also one of the things that is very stigmatized and put onto the LGBT community. Well, you yep. guys are saying they destroyed cities after y'all. It's like, well, slow down and really take that into context. Uh -huh. well, thank you. You're welcome. And can I go next? Yeah, I just want to say, um, I'm, I'm sorry. I'm sorry that your community has failed you. Um, you know, again, I'm a biblicist. I always have to bring it back to the Bible. Uh, the Bible is just story after story about people not getting it right on the first try. Uh, you know, I mean, pick your book. Um, you know, Abraham makes mistakes by almost any interpretation. I mean, you really have to go out of your way to think that he's perfect. Uh, you know, Peter doesn't get it right, uh, you know, and that's not even getting into the abstract stuff. I mean, the early Israelites hadn't really understood monotheism, hadn't understood the afterlife. Uh, you know, we think of monotheism in the afterlife as defining features of our, of our faith, and, and, you know, we spent hundreds of years not really understanding that. Um, I don't know if that's consoling, that I think in a few hundred years we're going to be a little bit less wrong than we are now, uh, but I do, I do think that that's the work of theologians that uh, we receive a tradition. Uh, there's plenty of reasons to say, screw this and drop it and keep walking the other direction. But I think that there, there, there's just enough in there uh, uh, that, it's, that it's worth you know, going through the struggle to say, you know, can, can we work towards the day uh, when you know, the lion and the lamb lie down together? Can we work towards the day uh, when, when everything is the way it's, it's eventually going to be. Uh, and it, it may seem like it's going to take a while. Um, I mean, boy, I just, I mean, all these verses are flying through my head. I'll just pick one and shut up. Um, you know, the, the, what, what we always hear at graduation, you're probably here, so we invite these speakers to come in. They always quote Jeremiah. I can't tell you how many times I've heard Jeremiah quoted. And it's, it's a verse about, uh, you know, I have plans for you that you will have a better day. No one ever finishes the verse. The verse is after 70 years, this will happen. And no one wants to say that to a 21 year old who's graduating college. It's very difficult to say that better days are ahead, but it's gonna take some patience. You know, I'm leading you out of Egypt, here's a covenant. Oh, by the way, it's gonna be 40 years and then you'll have the promised land. Uh, you know, it, it does take a lot of patience and um, it, it's, it's very painful, uh, you know, during the moments of that struggle. But I, I still I still walk away with, with hope. Um, if I may butt in here. <laughs> uh, thank you. Your name, please? Paulina. Malina? Paulina. Paulina. Thank you, Paulina. I think um, you know, along the lines that we've been um, discussing here together, um, everybody remembers Galileo, right? And, and how it took a long time for the church to recognize that, you know, we had got our physics wrong. <laughs> you know, and that physics was not theology. <laughs> and that we had, you know, out of our respect for creation and of God's plan, you know, to, to look at creation under, under another light, the cosmos under another light, you know. And, and now everybody is into, you know, Big Bang theory and and so on. I think that uh, the, n the next revolution that needs to take place is on anthropology. Is that the church um, expresses its belief and, and, and theology based on an understanding of what a human being is. And that understanding comes, yes, in a sense from the Bible, from the scripture, from revelation, but as we, as Antonio spoke about earlier on, those texts were written by human beings, so it's also, they also bear their understanding of what, their culturally limited, historically conditioned understanding of what a human being is. Um, and, and so for every period of history in, in the church, um, so, so we need to broaden our, our understanding of what a human being is, with the relationship, you know, with the earth, with the other beings, with animals, with, uh, and, and the more we're going to broaden that, I guess our theology is going to catch up with uh, our hasty judgments 
and, uh, and expressions of what is sin or what is not, and our misreadings of texts that are not actually saying so, right? At least one would hope, but again, it's a matter of time. And if it can be any consolation, uh, in that sense, the LGBTQ community is like Galileo, in a sense, challenging um, uh, our, our growing up into a, a more understanding anthropology. Thank you. Um, I mean, on the one hand, I see hands, on the other hand, we are kind of behind schedule. Can we maybe just have a few like short comments? And I promise I will shut up because I know I'm guilty of, of bringing us over time. But if it's questions, right? Or yeah. I don't want to cut anyone off. I just if we can maybe move towards the the brief answer or the brief comment phase. I have a brief comment, <laughs> not a question. I don't know if I'm okay. At the beginning of this panel, um, we were talking about um, not using present day categories to read scripture. But I'd like to kind of throw a surprise for you. Um, people outside of Israel in the ancient Near East had the concept of a third gender or non-binary person. Um, so in that category were all kinds of people, like people who were not married, people who were gay, people who were lesbian, et cetera, et cetera. They were non they were part of the third gender, and they were not necessarily um, put down. Okay? So if you would like to read all about this, the scholar who's bringing this forward, his name is Ilan Peled, P-E-L-E-D, and the article is found in Biblical Archaeology Review. Okay. So just another thing to think about. Uh, when we think about the biblical world. I also have ju just one brief comment. I've thought of a lot about what uh, Dr. Luna said because in many ways, Galileo and Copernicus are the best examples sometimes of how sometimes science, that's why I was making the distinction between science and, and, and theology, can come to, can bring us to a conclusion before we even have had time to wrestle with it at the theological level. So we need patience to do that. But of course, how can a suffering community, <laughs> if you want to call it that, how can a suffering community be patient? And it reminds me of Jeremiah, when he is thrown into the cistern, really our septic tank nowadays, and tells God, you duped me, O oh Lord, and you have me here. Yet, you're so much deep in my heart that I will still go and proclaim your news, your good news. So for me, it's, it's a matter of encouraging people to even in the depth of our own suffering, whatever that may be, you still, if you believe in your heart that God is there with you, stay with God, because God is staying with you even if you're not recognized as such. The black community in the United States went through that. Immigrants are going through that nowadays, not just the LGBT community. Women have gone through that in so many places around the world, and they haven't lost the faith, the faith in God. And thankfully, many times, the faith in the church as well. I would, I would add just one brief concluding comment. You ask, is homosexuality sinful, right? Uh, I, I, I want to point out that why you ask matters, and it, asks, it, it matters to Jesus as well, right? The rich young man comes to Jesus and he wants to know, what does it mean to be perfect, or how can I be perfect, right? And Jesus gives him an answer. The Pharisees come to Jesus, and they ask, why are your followers picking grain on the Sabbath? And they know, they know that that's not allowed. They're not asking so they can understand how to be perfect, so they can better observe the law. They're asking because they are trying to condemn. Right? They are asking, is this a sin? 
not because they're concerned about the beam in their own eye, but because they want to point out the splinter in their neighbors. Right? And it's Jesus who responds to them and tells them, truly you do not yet understand the words of Hosea when God says, I desire love, not sacrifice. Love, not sacrifice. Right? So I just wanted to point that out for you as well. Francis, I think Pope Francis has made it clear that we're an inclusive church, right? We're supposed to be inclusive um, and thinking about people who are marginalized. But I find it difficult um, in going to parishes and being a part of a parish to find a place or feel like it's a place that's welcoming to all. So I was just wanted to quickly ask, why do you think that's such a big problem and why is there such divisiveness with being a place that's welcoming to all? I think part of it is just the American political context. Mm -hmm. It's not the church. The church, sometimes people in the church can be co-opted by politics to, 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 to look at the same words and think that it is a political issue. It is not. And unfortunately, as, as she was bringing up, sometimes the leaders in the church can also be co-opted. But the ideal is that we're not to be political in the church. We are supposed to be that welcoming of the strangers and the marginalized and the poor and the oppressed. So anywhere around the world where I go, if I, if I go to a Catholic church, even if I don't feel welcome, I know that, that God is welcoming me. And that can be difficult for, for, for some of us, obviously, right? But that's the point. Wherever you are, it's not about the politics. It's about your faith. Maybe one last. I saw another hand, but it really needs to be the last one. David, I think. Yeah. He, he's been. I had a question about that was on the screen about um, labor pains, and I was hoping you could be able to address <laughs> the theological reasons why they happen. The young woman who actually asked that question sat down with us at the table there. And I think the question is um, relating to Genesis 3. Um, her question was, help me here, I'm trying to remember. I think her question was, um, you go ahead. Well, she, she, at least how she phrased it to us, it may be up there, at least how she phrased it to us was, okay. Mary doesn't have original sin, right? Mary doesn't experience labor pains. We believe that baptism removes original sin. So why would a woman have labor pains after undergoing baptism? Right, that was the question. And so basically what we said was, we need to distinguish between, again, the, 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 the biology and the creatureliness of pain and the theological aspect of it. Because we are created, we're always going to, to suffer something or we're going to feel something. That doesn't mean that we don't have the right relationship with God. The important thing here is the connection to God. The pain is just because we are human beings, because we're creatures. And, but we also asked her, you know, why, why did you, how did you come up with that question? And basically it was some anxiety over her own labor pains if she were ever to, 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 to have a child. So there was anxiety and a little bit of frustration about it. I promise to not ramble, but I, just, I think there's something really fundamental here uh, that, that religions of the world have struggled with for th millennia, and that is the question of, uh, is it possible to be good? Uh, is it beyond our control to avoid sin? And the Israelites and the Catholic tradition uh, say that it is possible to, to, be, to be good. It is possible to overcome sin. Um, for, the, for the Israelites, it was saying that we were, we were made good, as opposed to the Babylonians, saying that we were made out of rebellious materials. Uh, for our tradition, uh, it's that Jesus takes away the sins of the world. 
Uh, we say that three times in Latin, uh, partly because it's really counterintuitive, because there's plenty <laughs> of sin left. It's not that there's no sin left, it's that uh, the possibility of overcoming sin is now possible. Uh, so baptism doesn't, doesn't mean that uh, you know, you're not going to suffer, uh, it, it means that uh, you participate in the possibility uh, of, of victory, of victory over sin, and victory over death, uh, which is what we participate in with risen Christ. Why um, let's not change their mind, change them. I can't change them. Mm -hmm. you know, what do we do? What do we do? Is your question, how do I love this person? No, just mm -hmm. um, over time, can I have conversations with them to where they see the light mm -hmm. from a Christian standpoint? Or uh, I don't know how that's possible other than like praying for them. I'm not Jesus, I'm not the Pope, I'm not a prophet, I'm not like spiritual enough or holy enough to, you know, get into their heart and change them, but, you know, I got my own issues, but. I want to focus on those. Since this is somebody I care about that uh, isn't just a friend. So we put out the, the respect guidelines, mm -hmm. uh, and they're not guidelines only, also. I, I can't understand also, you because of the mask. Oh. So we put out there, one of the, the handouts is the respect guidelines, which are not only guidelines as to how we communicate with one another, but it's also to help us kind of look at our own assumptions or our own perspectives and perhaps then learn to empathize with the other person to see their point of view as we also would like them to see our point of view. So maybe you might want to begin with that looking at not changing them, but helping you walk with them wherever God wants to take you and take them. Yeah, because it's not that I have trouble, trouble loving them. I don't judge them. It's just that, uh, you know, it's like, 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 I think, uh, in fact, Jesus had a similar struggle, right? When he encounters the Canaanite woman, um, he doesn't immediately expect that he's going to offer her salvation, um, that she is meant, right, for the kingdom of heaven. Um, it is her faith that saves her, right? It is her faith that saves her, not being a member of the people of Israel, not uh, demonstrating by some rigorous application of the law uh, that she is a perfect person. It's her faith in God and the love of God and the forgiveness that's possible through God that saves her. So that is a hard message to preach. I, I don't envy, I don't envy your struggle. That is a hard message to preach. And I think the grace that God gives us is that if we are not the people to preach it, we don't have to, uh, because fortunately there are others that are better equipped. So it's a lot to take on to say that you want to uh, evangelize or, or get her to see the light. And I would, I would encourage you to let God do that work. I saw Edgar had his hand up for a while now, but maybe the very last comment or question? We do need a microphone. Okay. It's for the people on Just mindful of time that we can... Uh, I just wanted to read a verse from Romans chapter 1, verse 26, and maybe you can help me interpret it. Therefore God handed them over to degrading passions. Their females exchanged natural relations for unnatural, and the males likewise gave up natural relations with females, with, with females and burned with lust for one another. Males did shameful things with males and thus received in their own persons the due penalty for their perversity. So uh, in the interest of time, I would just say that I immediately ran over to my Greek New Testament. 
um, because my, my first question would be about the translation that you have. Um, so it was already mentioned that when we do our acts of interpretation, one of the tools that we have as a benefit is to go to the original language in which it was written in its time and place. Um, and then my second question would be, <coughs> excuse me, in its time and place, we have uh, God hand them over es pate atemias into passions that are unlawful or unright, um, unrighteous perhaps. Um, what did that mean? when Paul says passions in a Greek philosophical tradition that's part of his world, I would wanna know what he means by that. Um, and is it about dispositions? Is it about actions? Is it about motivations? Um, so I would wanna do a lot of digging into that verse to see what can I gather from the historical context and the way that it was said. Um, that's just sort of my modeling for you my starting point when you ask me that question about can you help me interpret it that's where i would want to go first um. i don't think there's any doubt that, 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 that there are, that there's the, the scriptures model love and and model hate um, model uh human sexuality at its best and human sexuality at its worst um i, I think that for me the categories that would be important is are, are we are we talking uh, about love, or are we talking about uh, a use of sexuality without love? Uh, I don't feel like um, I don't feel like there's anything wrong with saying that that people are going going uh, astray when they're using their sexuality in the absence of, of love. Um, but I don't think that that uh, necessarily um, should should cause us to look at others with with uh, conviction that we know God's plan for them. I guess reading that Bible verse in this context is what I'm having a hard time with the Catholic Church, or with the believers within the Catholic Church. They're so certain that that Bible verse means what they think it means, in the sense that he just pulled it out to say that homosexuality is it. He literally just read, you should not live with a man, you should not live with a woman, a woman shouldn't do it. And I feel like I, I'm studied this a little bit, I'm not sure, and I would love to hear what she has to say about it. I know we're out of town, so I won't ramble, but essentially, like, could Paul have been talking to a specific audience of Romans who were partaking in potential, like, worshiping pagan gods who meant they were, you know, you know, at the time, uh, in a ritual where they would lay with, like, orgies with homosexuals, a bunch of, like, gay, or not necessarily gay people, but just, like, sleeping with the same sex to worship another god, and could have Paul been condemning that per se, rather than condemning all of homosexuality put together at once, and it's like, could we explore it in that realm, rather than... Yeah, there's a lot about the Roman Empire to hate, which uh, I think <laughs> actually is a good segue to talking about Revelation. Uh, the book of Revelation is uh, largely a critique of the, the false glory of the Roman Empire, uh, and, and how it, it, it wields uh, power over human beings. Um, but I do think we, we deserve a break, right?